Thank you all very much for joining us this morning. My name is Ray Gustin, and I'd like to welcome you today to our event, which is part of the Greenwich Roundtable's continuing series on private equity investing. Our session this morning, Headwinds in Private Equity, deals with a topic close to the heart of our moderator, Phil Zecker. Phil is a valued, longtime member of the Roundtable and the Chief Investment Officer at Michigan State University. Phil has been an influential member of the Roundtable's Best Practices White Paper Series and has also spoken and written on the benefits and challenges of investing in private equity. Phil has assembled a highly experienced and enlightened panel of experts today. I'll briefly introduce our panelists after I say this. The comments by our speakers reflect their own views rather than the views of the Greenwich Roundtable or its members. Next to Phil is uh, Rudy Stuck. Rudy heads Warburg Pincus's quantitative research group. Prior to joining Warburg Pincus in 2014, Dr. Stuck was a quantitative researcher with a focus on private equity for almost 10 years, seven of which he spent at Oxford University's Syed Business School. In this capacity, Rudy worked closely with a number of LPs and GPs in the U.S. and Europe. Marcy Hadel is a managing director at Performance Equity and a member of the firm's investment committee. Prior to joining Performance Equity, Ms. Hadel was a portfolio manager in the private equity group at General Motors Investment Management. Marcy has also held senior positions at firms, including Alliance Capital, where she was a vice president of fixed income, and MetLife Investments in London, where she was responsible for managing MetLife's European direct private equity and mezzanine portfolio, as well as its European fund sponsor relationships. And at the end, Vic Sani is a senior managing director at Blackstone and chief operating officer of the private equity group. Before joining uh, Blackstone in 2007, Vic was a managing director in Deutsche Bank's financial sponsors group, where he was responsible for managing the firm's relationships with Blackstone and several other uh, large private equity firms. Prior to joining Deutsche Bank, Vic was an associate at the law firm of Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. Now please welcome Phil as he sets the table for today's discussion. Thank you, Ray. Um, <clears throat> First, I'd like to, to thank our uh, speakers for coming in today and, and, and presenting to us. Uh, despite the strong bull market that we saw in 2017, allocators still face a world of expensive assets and lower than expected returns, long-term returns. Listening to the consultants we have, uh, one constantly hears that the Ill investing in illiquid investments, private equity in particular, is, is the surest path to to earning the sort of returns that we need to meet our obligations. It seems that we've heeded this call in droves. By November of last year, uncalled capital stands at an all-time high, according to Prequin. And last week, PitchBook reported that the slowest year-over-year -year growth in, private in new private equity firms. And they asked the question, has the industry hit saturation? We all know any time a lot of money follows one idea, opportunities to outperform become harder to find. Our three guests today are here to address some of the challenges facing private equity in a world full of eager money and more, many more players, skilled players. Each of them can offer a lot of insight on, to, the, to the broad market, but I've asked each of them to focus on one particular aspect. First, I've asked Rudy to put his academic hat back on and address the topic of persistence of persistence. Not only does market, do the markets have more participants today than before, they are all very skillful, and we know that from the paradox of skill that when you have many very skillful players, the outcomes become more dependent on luck rather than skill. Next, Marcy, who is an allocator to very many funds, will address the high valuations and the vast amount of money sitting on the sidelines looking for opportunities and how we should adjust our expectations. And lastly, we ask Vic to wrap up the discussion Looking a little further into the future, as most of us are very long-term investors, does it make sense to have funds that turn over companies every five years? Is this the institutional version of churn? Vic will discuss where he sees the market going and the, emerging, and the emergence of long-dated funds. With that, I'll turn it over to, to Rudy to start. All right. Thank you very much, um, Ray and Phil. 
um, for having me here this morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I would like to present uh, some of the main findings of a research paper which I co-author. Um, the title of the paper is Has Persistence... Okay, um, getting a bit closer to the microphone. Um, so the title of the paper is um, Has Persistence Persisted in Private Equity? It is uh, some joint research with Bob Harris from the University of Virginia, Steve Kaplan from the University of Chicago, and uh, my former colleague and supervisor, Tim Jenkinson, from the University of Oxford. Um, the research questions we address in our paper are the following. Is there performance persistence in private equity across successive funds by the same GP within the same strategy? Has performance persistence changed as the asset class has matured and got increasingly crowded? And how about style drift and size drift as GPs have grown in scope and scale? So I hope my... Um, Presentation is not too technical. Unfortunately, I cannot use any slides here this morning. Um, the data we use for our research is from Burgess. Our sample includes the cash flows and quarterly net asset values of about uh, 1,250 buyout funds and about 1,400 venture capital funds. Um, I would like to speak about persistence um, of buyout funds and venture, and venture capital funds um, separately. So let's start with um, buyout funds. If you look at the whole sample funds from 1980 to 2012, you actually find persistence across all quartiles. What this means is that for a new fund to end up in the same quartile as the previous fund, chances are larger than 25% in all four cases. 25% would be a random chance. With regards to the top quartile, chances for a top quartile fund to be followed by another top quartile fund across the whole sample are 32%. So a bit higher than random, definitely some persistence there. Um, on the other side, chances for a top quartile fund to be followed by a fourth quartile fund, for example, are below 20%, and vice versa, chances for a third quartile or fourth quartile fund to be followed by a top quartile fund um, are also below 20%. So consequently, you find quite some dispersion in returns um, of the new fund depending on the quartile of the previous fund. Now, if, if we look at funds from the 1980s and uh, 1990s only, which I will refer to as um, the old days going forward, we find that persistence has actually been much more pronounced. Um, there has been a 40% chance for a top quartile fund to be followed by another top quartile fund. Actually, the same was the case in the bottom quarter, which always, in my mind, raised the question, well, who actually invests in fourth quarter funds? But um, a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and now, as you would expect, given that there has been more persistence in the old days, the dispersion of returns of the new fund, depending on the previous fund's quarter, um, has been even greater. Now, if we look at funds in the 2000s, which I will refer to as, as the new days, we find that persistence in the top quartile has come down quite a bit from 40% to 29%. So a little bit has persisted, but not so much. Consequently, the dispersion in returns of the current fund clustered by the previous fund's quartile has narrowed significantly. If we look at US buyout funds in the 2000s only, we find that persistence has basically disappeared. 26% chance for a top quartile fund to be followed by another top quartile fund, basically random. So this somewhat ongoing persistence really seems to be driven by overseas funds, which is perhaps not too surprising, given that um, the U.S. is the most mature, most crowded, most efficient PE market. Um, we have also looked as to whether there's persistence beyond any two adjacent funds. So this means comparing the new funds quartile against the quartile of its second previous fund. And we actually found nothing, not even in the old days, totally random. Uh, what this means is that, the way I used to phrase it, is that persistence has or is and has always been kind of short-lived. But what this also means is that looking at a GP's track record beyond the currently active fund yields little to no additional information. Um, now, having said this, the fact that persistence seemed to have um, more or less disappeared, certainly in the U.S., one could interpret this as some, um, let's say, bad news. However, maybe some mitigating uh, comments to this message, we actually find that persistence has never been identifiable. 
Um, so what we have done so far, what I've told you about so far, is comparing the ex post most recent performance of any two adjacent funds. What is more relevant for practitioners is to compare the performance of the current, soon to be previous fund, at the time the new fund is raised, um, yeah, towards the eventual outcome in performance of the new fund. Because this interim performance information is really all that is available. Um, so now, if we compare this interim performance of the current fund against the final outcome of the new fund, we find no relationship at all. Um, neither in the old days nor in the new days. Um, the reason for this is that there's only a limited relationship between the interim performance of a fund and the final performance of a fund. And now, to some extent, this may also explain why there's some bottom quartile persistence. Funds that eventually end up in the bottom quartile do not necessarily show up as bottom quartile funds at the time the GP raises the new fund. Um, just briefly, there's also no relationship um, between the interim performance of the second previous fund and the new fund. So doesn't uh, does also not help to look further back um, with regards to interim performance. Um, to summarize this part on buyout funds, so we found some evidence for top quartile persistence across the whole sample, 1980 to 2012. Um, while top quartile persistence was meaningful in the old days, it has come down significantly. This is especially the case for U.S. funds, where it has basically disappeared. Remaining persistence in the new days really seems to be driven by non-U.S. funds, overseas funds. Persistence has always been short-lived. The second previous fund, uh, funds returns, yield little to no information. And identifying upcoming top quartile funds at times of fundraising has always been nearly impossible. Um, two more comments, what we looked at um, for buyout funds. We looked at first-time funds, and um, first-time funds do not appear, or investing in first-time funds does not appear to be a winning strategy per se. So first-time first -time funds are pretty much equally distributed across all quartiles, and their combined average performance is average. Also, we could not find any evidence, which was really interesting to see, that um, the extent to which um, the new fund is larger than the previous fund is any related to um, a lower performance going forward. Now let's have a look at venture capital funds. Um, again, over the whole sample, 1980 to 2012, there is clear evidence of quartile persistence across all quartiles, especially so in the top and, uh, and bottom quartile with a 40% probability. Returns by current funds are significantly higher if the previous fund was top, uh, top quartile. Um, interestingly, chances for a top quartile fund to be followed by a second quartile fund and vice versa are actually random. So there is a really high level of stickiness um, within these quartiles, especially in the top quartile. Also interestingly, first-time funds do not appear to be um, a losing strategy in venture capital, which is what one might perhaps expect, given that it really requires a lot of skill, experience, network. So first-time funds perform about average in venture capital. Um, in the old days, top quartile persistence was much more pronounced. Chances for a top quartile fund to be followed by another top quartile fund were even 45%. In the new days, persistence in the top quartile has persisted, but come down by, has come down by 10% to 35%. <coughs> for U.S. venture funds, however, top quartile persistence has actually persisted at a level above 40%. This is in contrast to buyout funds where persistence, as I mentioned, um, has basically disappeared in the United States. Also in contrast to buyout funds, persistence in venture capital persists beyond any two adjacent funds, so comparing fund N to fund N minus two, and this is um, especially the case in the top quartile. And um, there's actually no difference between the old days and the new days, so um, the link between fund N minus two and fund N in venture capital is about 40% um, throughout time. Now, if we look again at the interim performance when a new venture capital fund is raised, we actually find a meaningful link between the interim performance of the current fund and the eventual performance of the new fund, but only in the old days, no longer in the new days, unfortunately. However, there continues to be a relationship between the interim performance of the second previous fund and the new fund, which is interesting. So to summarize on venture capital, there is clear evidence for quartile persistence, especially in the top and bottom quartile across the whole sample. Top quartile persistence was very high in the old days, but it continues to be meaningful in more recent times. 
Top quartile persistence has been more persistent for U.S. venture fund. Top quartile persistence has persisted and continues to persist across any two adjacent funds. And well, while interim performance of the previous fund was informative regarding the current fund's outcome, interim performance of the second previous fund continues to be informative. Um, and again, betting on first-time funds does not appear to be a losing strategy per se in venture capital. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, before we move on, a, a question for you. The quartile ratings that you're talking about are yeah. based on IRR? Um, that's right. Um, kind of the percentage numbers I um, quoted based on IRR, but you find basically the same results if you look at um, money multiple or kind of alpha, public market equivalent. Okay, so there's no, so it, it's not measure dependent, the, the persistence, it, it's, it's Correct. independent Correct. of the, so the, how you're measuring the performance of the. Fund. Correct, the findings are basically very similar. Uh, Marcy? Thanks, Phil. So uh, return expectations, it's always a fun and uh, complex topic. Uh, returns have been really, really good uh, over the past, re really since the crisis. Uh, we've had very good returns in the industry. It's, uh, as everyone here knows, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, that has cost a lot of money to um, flow, flow into the asset class. The, um, the distributions have been good, which has um, also caused folks to feel like they're running in place to get to their target allocation. So we just keep seeing the uh, amount of capital that GPs are raising go up. Um, the, uh, so Phil and I were talking about this, uh, and it looks like there's – the numbers vary. It depends on what data source you're looking at, but there's – somewhere between a trillion and some folks will quote, you know, trillion and a half of dry powder uh, in the market. That, according to the last couple of years of deal flow, amounts to somewhere between six and seven years uh, of dry powder. You combine that with the fact that purchase price multiples are eclipsing pre-crisis purchase price multiples, and we as investors certainly see caution lights. But um, you know, what, as we think about it, um, I think we think the long-term prospect for private equity is very good. But looking at what has happened uh, in the past couple of years, it's probably not repeatable. The pooled average for uh, the one-year private equity returns are about 17%. If you look at top quartile returns for private equity vintage years since the crisis through what I would call more mature vintage years, the uh, top quartile returns range between a low of 19 percent and a high of 25, almost 26 percent for about five vintage years. And most of them are in the solid 20s, 22, 23, 24 uh, percent. And that's fantastic uh, for top quartile quartile private equity, uh, I'm talking buyout when I speak about this, by the way. I'm not including venture. Uh, and if you look at the median returns for those same vintage years, they're in the mid to high teens. So if you just chose a median manager, you are producing high teen returns for vintage years since the, the crisis. That, that's really, really good. We don't think that's going to continue for a couple of reasons. Uh, a lot of the returns have been driven by deals that were uh, put in, invested in when prices were a lot lower. So you're looking at purchase price multiples post-crisis for 2010, 11, 12, and even some of 2013 purchase price multiples were 8.5 to 9.5 times. And right now, since 2014, 15, 16, and of course in 17, purchase price multiples were turned to two turns higher. Uh, last year, I, the total market purchase price multiple was about 10 and a half. Uh, that alone would tell you uh, there's probably not too much multiple arbitrage in general left in, in the industry, and some people have capitalized on that. Uh, another thing that we've noticed is that equity contributions have gone up um, as a whole in the industry. So post-crisis, a lot of the deals you were seeing somewhere between 36, 38 percent equity contribution. And the last couple of years, we've been seeing about 40 percent. So all things being equal, you're going to see some compression and, and returns from money that's been put to work in the past couple of years. Uh, we don't. We don't think that it's going to, though, deviate from the long-term average. 
Long term, if you look at private equity 15-year returns, uh, the, the top quartile has been in the mid to high teens, and the median has been in the low to mid teens. And that's how we look at our portfolio on the long term. Of course, if you talk to consultants or if you're doing ALM studies, the return assumptions tend to be a lot lower to give you, you some room for error, I suppose. Um, uh, and I see studies out there pointing to 65 to 11 12%. Some, a lot of our clients are in the 10 and 11% uh, long-term return assumptions. So uh, it's, um, it's been good. I think it's going to return to, it's going to probably mean revert over the next few years. And some of the things that we're doing in our portfolio to, uh, to combat that is we've leaned a little more into mid-market. We've always, up until the crisis, we ran a balanced 50-50 large cap mid-market manager portfolio. Uh, Post-crisis, we leaned a little more into mid-market managers. We still are big believers in large cap managers like you know, VIX, Blackstone. We think that they will provide very good returns to our clients. We, um, we co-invest with our managers, so we lean into mid-market co-investment opportunities. And the primary reason we say mid-market is a lot of those are growth strategies, uh, buy and build platforms, and the purchase price multiples and the mid-market um, are a little lower. Some would say that's commensurate with the risk, and we understand that. We understand where we're buying, but it does, um, we believe, it will allow us to produce some uh, some nice returns. The other thing that we do is we include venture and the client's portfolio that we actually have control over their whole portfolio. We're including somewhere between 15 to 20% early stage venture. And we think that the venture cycle moves very differently than the buyout cycle. It's not 100% correlated. You're getting access to different parts of the economy that the buyout uh, managers don't access uh, right now. So. All in all, we think that will help mitigate some of the declining returns in, in the buyout. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, let me ask a question um, for you know a lot of institutions these days who maybe didn't have a big private equity book are being encouraged to do so now, um, given sort of the low, the low rate expectations for the long term. Um, how would you view, with given, sort of considering the amount of dry powder that is out there, if you're not already in a fully established program, how would you view, view coming in and trying to, to get allocations in a space like this where there's a lot of competition for, for out access? And Look, I, I think the good news is it's a mature industry. There are a lot of really good managers out there. Uh, you, you cannot time private equity. The money you commit today will be put to work over the next five or six years. There's likely... Uh, not an economist, but likely to be some type of slowdown uh, over the next five to six years. And uh, the best performing vintages are post-recession vintages. So I think you have an opportunity to get in, and there may be some frothiness right now, but you have to look at it more from the long-term perspective. And I, I would definitely not hesitate to start a program right now. Okay. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Vic. Great. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I was going to start uh, with a very brief but uh, heart heartfelt but self-serving uh, defense of traditional private equity and then <laughs> talk about the topic which, uh, which Phil actually wanted me to talk about. Um, so uh, I, I do think uh, uh, traditional private equity is, is a robust model that will be around for a long time and, and should play an important role in a portfolio of an endowment or a family office or, or a high net worth uh, individual and, and I do think over over time, not in a moment like today, in any one year or two years, um, that private equity uh, will outperform pro uh, public equities by by a reasonable amount. And I actually believe uh, it entails uh, less risk uh, to the investor, not more risk. Um, and how does traditional private equity uh, do that? Uh, it does that. Uh, uh, a lot through cycle timing, both in terms of when you buy, but also in terms of when you sell. Um, and then through what we call uh, at Blackstone, and every firm has sort of a different jargon for it, uh, operating intervention, figuring out ways to make the companies you buy better, margin improvement, cost reduction, new products, new ma management, acquisitions, geographic expansion, uh, and all that. Um, and so I, I think there's, there's a uh, large and strong place in the world for that, but uh, the topic which uh, we've been thinking a lot about over the last few years and that Phil asked me to talk about is uh, 
what are some of the shortcomings of that model um, and what are some of the alternatives to that model or expansions or complements uh, to that traditional model. Um, and so starting with, the, the question uh, we ask is, what types of businesses do all of us want to own? Many of you, I think, in this room uh, probably have backgrounds in family-owned businesses, companies that were owned for a long time. And so what, so what do you look for? You look for companies with long operating histories, companies that have shown resilience through cycles, companies that have pricing power, uh, companies that you believe are insulated from technology threats, regulatory threats. That, those are the kind of companies that we all instinctively want to own. Um, the problem uh, with businesses like that is that uh, they typically are hard to buy because if you own one, you, you don't actually want to sell it. Why would you sell it? Um, and when they're sold, uh, they don't attract a 20 or 25 percent cost of capital. They're, they're too high quality uh, businesses uh, to attract a private equity cost of capital. And so those businesses are rarely available to traditional private capital because the cost of the capital um, is too high because the owners are loath, uh, loath to sell them at a price that would generate that sort of a return um, for the next buyer. And so traditional private equity, not always, but more often than not, doesn't have access to the lowest risk, highest quality, most enduring businesses. We, we're not able to buy those. Um, likewise, in a traditional private equity fund structure, uh, the, the general partner, the Warburg Pincus or Blackstone, whomever it is, uh, you're, you're typically forced to sell your winners, which is a bit counterintuitive because in order to return capital, you have a fund, it's got a five-year investment life, it's got a 10-year fund life. Um, the limited partners, uh, particularly uh, p pension plans, are in need of the cash. They need the money back. And so what do you end up doing? You sell your best companies. And the companies you end up holding the longest tend to be your weakest companies uh, because you can't sell them. And so uh, what ends up happening is you sell your best companies and for your customer who doesn't have a near-term liquidity need, they have to figure out how to redeploy the capital, which is very difficult. And if it's a high-quality company and it's compounding at a low to mid-teens rate of return with low risk, it's very difficult for the customer to replace that capital uh, with capital of equivalent risk in return. And so you have this problem of, great, I got the money back, but I don't actually need that liquidity. I have my fixed in income or what have you for liquidity, and now what do I do with the money? And so you have, um, uh, you have this redeployment issue. Uh, the other uh, sort of, a, and you get on kind of a hamster wheel. You sell the good companies, what do I do with the money? You reinvest, the money comes back, and you're, you're in this cycle. The other uh, sort of shortcoming of traditional private equity is because of this short time duration that the GP is forced into, uh, because the industry has been driven historically by pension fund allocations um, where they, they need the money, um, is your returns are driven much more by what we, we call extrinsic factors, um, market, macro, than intrinsic factors, uh, business quality. And so just to frame that a little bit for you all, if you hold a company for five years and you sell it for one multiple uh, less than you thought you would, you thought you would sell it for 10 and you end up selling it for nine because the world changed, you lose 500 basis points of return. It's crushing. So the market has a huge impact on that. If you hold the same company for 15 years and you sell it for one multiple less than you thought you were going to when you went to your investment committee and all that, you lose 50 basis points of return. Because, why? Because duration and because the business has grown so much over 15 years that the price you bought it for versus the price you sell it for doesn't really matter that much. What matters is the performance of the business. Likewise, if you can borrow one uh, turn less of leverage of debt in a five-year buyout, say you borrow, can only borrow five, five turns of debt versus six turns of debt, or, or today it would be seven versus eight, whatever it is, you lose 200 basis points of return, uh, which, is, which is very, very significant over five years. Over 15 years, <coughs> 75 basis points, so about a third. So again, because the underlying business is growing so much over time, and you're kind of amortizing that, that premium or discount over a longer time, it has a much lower impact on your return. And then the other thing, um, which, which I know uh, Phil has experienced in his portfolio, is 
when you have a business that's sold from sponsor A to sponsor B to sponsor C to sponsor D, then you all, um, every time there's a toll, every time the business is sold, uh, you crystallize carried interest, there's tax leakage at the enterprise level, um, there's tax at your level on receiving those proceeds, there are banker fees, legal fees, and, and, and. And you would have been much better off, now sometimes, the second GP and the third GP will, will do something fundamentally different to the business, but what I find is usually what the fourth GP is doing is different from the first, but you probably didn't need four people to own the business. Maybe, maybe two, because they were of different size, different strategy, and you would have been much better off owning that business once for 15 or 20 years than having owned it four times and, had, and having to go through four toll booths of carry, tax, fees, et cetera. You, you leak uh, a lot of your own return uh, because of the flip from A to B to C. And so what we've done um, at Blackstone, which is not uh, in replacement of our traditional private equity by any means, it's complementary to, and, and others were not alone in doing this, um, is try to figure out how to address this, what we think of as a whole in the private equity market. Because of course you have, uh, you have investment grade debt, non-investment grade debt. You have core real estate, opportunistic real estate. Why should that not exist uh, in the market uh, for private ownership of businesses? And so we've created uh, sort of a parallel strategy, same team, same investment experts, um, where we have a fund with a 20-year life. And our intention is to own four or five, six companies of the highest quality, much larger, and, and hold them for 15 plus years. And so uh, the investors, we call it sort of a coalition of the willing, uh, because you're, you're give, what are you giving up? You're giving up liquidity um, and you're enduring uh, concentration because rather than a private equity portfolio where for a firm of our scale, we might have 40 or 50 investments. In this instance, we'll have a handful of investments. And so every one, we, we have to be right uh, about every one and there will be very, very little liquidity, um, but compounding. Um, and so what, what ends up happening in a structure like that is we can generate um, with much lower rates of return, the same compounding uh, of money, which of course is what all of us at the end of the day, what, what for a part of our portfolio, IRRs are great, but for some part of the portfolio, it's about capital gain. It's about risk adjusted <coughs> capital gain. And we can generate with five to 700 basis points, lower IRRs, the same or higher multiples of money. And we, we charge in this strategy, which is not great, but it's the way it is, materially lower fees and carry, which is great for our customers, not so great for us. Why? Because the businesses require less intervention. They're, they don't need to be fixed as much. It's more about identification, uh, sourcing, um, and governance than it is necessarily about doing a huge cost takeout or doing seven acquisitions or changing management. And, and you're not on that flywheel of, okay, then we have to take it public, then we have to sell down the shares. So the fees and carry are much lower, and what we'll end up with um, is, o over time, a stable of 10 or 15 companies, which I think will compound at, at a very attractive absolute rates of return, but even more attractive uh, risk-adjusted uh, rates of return. So uh, I hope I didn't speak for too long, Phil. Um, it's not that different from what Warren Buffett does, but at a smaller scale, which is, of course, if you buy high quality businesses and own them for a long time, uh, you will generate a better return than trying to necessarily market time or having, I think one of the words you use is churn, uh, having a lot of churn um, in your portfolio. So I think this is something that the industry will evolve toward over time, not, as I said, not as necessarily a replacement to the traditional model, but Funnily, I think it fits best for uh, the endowment um, and family office um, universe and for the sovereign wealth fund universe. And everybody in the middle, and those are the parts of the market that are growing, everybody in the middle has an acute need for near-term liquidity because they have, the, generally they have uh, underfunded pensions. Um, but for those on the family office and the endowment side and those on the sovereign wealth fund side that have a much longer uh, view of the world and their portfolio, I, I think this will be a growing area over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Thank you, Vic. So I, I'll agree that we have, a, you know, in the endowment space, we have a, you know, a, a, the much longer view where that, that fits. But 
Uh, most investment committees in these days probably CIO 10 years at institutions is much less than the time period that you're talking about. How have, have institutions viewed making commitments that will are, are set to outlast any of them as far as looking at how do you evaluate these, how do you evaluate the, the, the decisions down the road, that sort of thing? It's, it's a great question, and, and the, the complement to that question is how do they view us because, of course, I'm probably not going to be here in 15 years over here, but not, you know, not doing this every day. Um, so that's, uh, and so I, I think uh, the focus really has to be on uh, quality of the businesses that are purchased and having real – now, you, you make a decision to commit, but you have to have confidence in the manager in terms of business quality. Um, and I think the strategy lends itself – uh, to larger global firms where no one person is necessarily that important because the firm is institutionalized and you know that there's process and risk management uh, and asset selection, which, which will endure and be consistent regardless of whose name is on the business card in you know year one, year 10, year 20. Uh, but it's, it's a great question. Okay, thanks. Uh, so should we open this up to the, to the floor for questions? Uh, well, you have to you're, – you're dynamic in owning these businesses, right? You, you don't uh, – and proactive, uh, you don't just sort of sit on it and wait for bad things to happen or, or good things. Um, and you're constantly, as you know, an active and controlling board member, uh, you're constantly looking around the corner, hopefully, you know, two to three years ahead um, as to what opportunities um, – and threats are to the business because if you can buy something that you believe is lower risk but it has some technological or other upside and even if you thought you were going to make a 15 percent return you end up making a 25 percent return that's not necessarily a bad thing um, and likewise you have to be cautious of uh, obsolescence or other you know sort of black swan not necessarily a black swan just things you didn't anticipate in the uh, in the early underwriting and so um, I, I think it's hard. You have to. You just have to be very vigilant about it. And at least for us, you know, when we're looking to make, whereas in our traditional private equity business, we'll make fifteen odd investments a year, looking to make one investment a year. Um, and so I think setting the bar really, really high, and uh, at the front end, the industries from which transactions like this will come and the ge geographies are are narrow. You're not going to invest um, in E and P companies because of volatility. You're probably not going to invest in non-investment grade lenders because of deep cyclicality. Um, you're probably not going to invest in the emerging markets. And so uh, you narrow the frame of geographies and assets and sectors, and, and then you just have to, I think, stay ahead of it. But it's, but it's a risk. You can't just be passive and sit back. What kind of companies have you invested in so far? Uh, we've made two investments, a relatively new strategy. We've made uh, two investments uh, thus far. One. Uh, is in a company that does uh, technical training for uh, healthcare paraprofessionals, uh, so nurses, PAs, what have you, um, which is a, a growing and very so technology enabled business uh, where the payor is the employer, um, not the individual, and the need for ongoing certification is effectively endless, and this company provides that training. Uh, and then we invested in, in the second investment uh, was it in uh, the largest for-profit uh, perf music performance rights organization in the United States, which is a business that goes to Pandora, Spotify, but also to the local bar in Greenwich um, and collects uh, royalties uh, for writers of songs. And, and it's, so it's a business that's grown uh, its revenues every year for the last 25 years. Um, and... Uh, it's it's a it's a very the music if any of you have spent any time in it the music industry and the monetization of intellectual property is very 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 complicated and this is really the only company of scale in the U.S. Uh, that that does that on a private for profit basis so those are the in two years those are the two companies we bought. How do you decide internally uh, which one of your funds uh, company belongs in because those two companies sound like it's a great question. Um, and so you look at um, first is what's, what's the cost of capital 
to which you can buy those those companies. We couldn't have purchased either of those companies to a rate of return in excess of 20 percent because they simply weren't available for sale. Um, so that's that that's the sort of the number one criteria. Um, but then you look for us at least we look at size of business, level of intervention, level of risk. What's what's the absolute return and what's the risk adjusted return? And very few things fall into the. That's why we've only done two deals in two years. Fall, fall into the category. Of, of being something that we think we can own for 15 years. Um, now, of course, if we think we own it for 15 years and it can generate a 30 percent return, you know, we would we would put it in the traditional private equity fund, which has a higher cost of capital. But it's it's level of intervention, uh, long term uh, risk in the business, and cost of capital. In the back. So. Uh I think, and Marcy can comment as well, um, it, frankly, it's been such a frothy and benign, benign, frothy, whatever you want to call it, fundraising environment for the industry um, that th there's been, everyone's been able to raise whatever they want to raise on, on more or less whatever terms they want. And then that's super pro-cyclical and that'll revert. Um, and so you've seen, um, actually, I think the, the fee uh, carry paradigm has shifted in the last two years, two to three years, in favor of the GP, um, where you've seen people reduce uh, the preferred hurdles, um, stop offering discounts, and so forth. But that'll, I think that, that always goes the other way, um, you know, when it's harder to raise money. I, I don't know if you have a different... No, I, I, would, I would just add, uh, not only reduce, but drop... Uh, the hurdles in certain GPs cases and I s recently saw a study by Callan looking at fees and it wasn't just um, private equity but private equity I believe was included and uh, there is no sign of uh, fee compression so they've done a study across their clients um, and I can say anecdotally we don't see it uh, so it doesn't look like it's happening. Seth? Yeah, maybe I'll start. I mean, we spend the, the probably the issue we worry most about um, is a mean reversion in cost of capital, uh, which is exactly what you're asking about. And if you know, if you you pay 12 or 13 times cash flow for a company today, and the risk-free rate goes from two and a half to four, you're going to sell that company for nine times cash flow. That's that that that's a fact. Um, and so, are you uh, doing enough? in the interim uh, to grow the, can you grow your way out of that? that? That's the question. And if you're buying something where you, you say, geez, it's a good company and I'm going to sell it, it's going to grow 3%, sort of unlevered, that's the rate of growth of the business, and then I'm going to sell it to the next person, that strategy in the last five years has worked very, very well because you've paid 12 and sold for 15 on high leverage. Um, if uh, We believe uh, if that's your strategy for the next five years, the returns are going to be single digit, hot mid to high single digit for the industry, and so you, I, I think it's it's the right question to focus on. Um, the, I think the positive is for private equity, where you do have more levers um, in terms of being able to transform businesses, and you can be much more selective about when you exit. It's it's much, to use hedge fund jargon, it's should be much more of an alpha asset class than a beta asset class. And in a lot of parts of alternatives, um, passive parts of alternatives, uh, the phenomena that you're citing, I think is going to have a real impact on returns in a rising, which are, which are, which are, there, there's a lot of levered 
levered passive beta and alternatives, and it will suffer greatly as rates rise. I just wonder if any of you have ever thought of the issue of instead of investing in private equity, uh, in, investing in the public companies that provide private equity, which have not uh, attracted the kind of interest that other sectors of the market have. I think Blackstone has been public and, and is, is barely above its IPO price of uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I hadn't noticed. So, <laughs> I'm today buying uh, the public companies. It gives you the diversification. It gives you everything you're talking about. And... and uh, that's my question. Well, for our clients, they, they do not want us buying public companies. And if I were not personally restricted because I have information on their underlying portfolio companies, I would do it, but I cannot do it. So it's good for you, but not for the client. <laughs> well, <laughs> I can't do it, so it would be good. Um, yeah, maybe I could quote one piece of research which um, has looked at the performance of public listed private equity. And, um, yeah, what um, those former colleagues of mine found is that there has actually been no alpha in those securities. So it's kind of, um, and the beta has been just a little bit above one, so nothing really to gain from that. Must have something to do with pricing, certain discounts on um, net asset value for those public listed vehicles. I think I'll be self-serving and truthful again. Um, I think that some of the issues with the publicly listed vehicles is they're, they're misunderstood today and they're perceived as having more volatility than a traditional mutual fund manager, even though they have less because the money is locked up for years and years and years. They're much more stable. Um, and they generate uh, very high dividend yields, all of them generate very, very high dividend yields. Uh, one of the complexities has been because of the structures of these entities uh, and the filing, you know, the K-1s and all of that, they're not, they can't, they're not index eligible because of the structures. Um, but, I, but I think, is it better than investing in a fund? It's different because it's much, it's more liquid and it generates a much higher yield. So it's, it's a, so it's, yeah, for a portion of your portfolio, um, it, I think it's, it's something that can generate very high yield and hopefully... And presumably, there's a chance that the new tax uh, bill is going to cause them to become corporations, in which case they would be indexable, and then there'd be a flood of money that wants to buy them. That's what I'm hoping, but yeah. <laughs> yes. That's your view on the tax That's, situation. Is I, that going to cause the change? It's not, I, it's, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but I think, I think it's, a, it's the right, it it's like the right question. Deal. <laughs> in the back. So a lot of investors struggle with how to model private equity for their strategic asset allocation, which is the most important part of the investment process. And I uh, would love your thoughts on sort of a general framework of, you know, most of the time I try to recommend that you should assume no manager selection when you're doing a strategic asset allocation. You're just holding the market. And so when I think about private equity, um, the natural anchor for me is what's the risk-adjusted return for public equity and why might private equity at the market level be different? And one might be an illiquidity premium that would raise the sharp ratio of risk-adjusted return in private equity, but on the offsetting side, private equity has much higher fees. So maybe the risk-adjusted return of private equity net is actually very similar to public equity. And then two other things come to mind, which is sort of the structural desire for investors to pay for the additional leverage that private equity gives you, which means maybe that lowers its risk-adjusted return versus publics because they're overpaying for the leverage and then the additional service of the price smoothing. People prefer the price smoothing of private equity over public equity so we could argue about whether that means private equity at the market level should have a lower risk-adjusted return than public equity in your strategic asset allocation. But let's say we sort of said net-net, they're about the same in terms of the risk-adjusted return. Would love some thoughts on what's a reasonable way to model private equity in a strategic asset allocation. Any comments on some of the themes that I just uh, 
again, at the end of the day, that's that's the thing that allocators care about. I take that one ready. Um, I can give it a try. Um, <laughs> so, while well, measuring kind of the risk in private equity or any kind of um, illiquid um, assets alternatives um, has been infeasible so far, and uh, I'm personally not particularly optimistic about it. That said, um, I'm also not sure whether kind of measuring risk via, for example, beta, which is um, or the beta coefficient, which is a standard practice um, for liquid securities, is, is the right approach. Um, I am personally not convinced that what is called modern portfolio theory, still called modern portfolio theory, is really or necessarily the best choice for asset allocation. So personally, I am more of a proponent kind of to um, have some two-bucket approach. One is um, a liquid part in your um, – well, of your overall assets. One is the illiquid part, kind of depending on your um, future capital needs, and then kind of treat both separately. Anybody else have any? Uh, anybody? Any other questions? You know, Philip, maybe we stick on this is an interesting topic. I think we should stick on this for a moment. I'm not, because we don't invest in a lot of private equity uh, funds. I'm not as familiar as many people in this room, but it'd be interesting for you all to talk about the cyclicality and correlation between uh, private equity and public equities, because I think the last speaker made some very interesting uh, points. So is this, in other words, simply uh, a means to take advantage of some uh, pricing, uh, misinformation or lack of pricing information? Are we really buying a cyclical strategy that maybe operates at a difference a different cycle, but is still quite correlated over the long term with public equities? And what does that imply? I'll, I'm probably the least qualified of the three, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I, I think um, the correlations are high. That's I mean the data is you, you can't avoid the data um, on that point, um, but. What, what private equity, I think, can do – I think investors, uh, the liquidity they believe, they, people uh, – <clears throat> there's less liquidity in your public investments than you believe there is. Because, of course, in a time when you really need to sell something or you believe, oh, my God, the world's ending, um, or we're just in a market correction, it's very difficult uh, to liquidate your public portfolio if it's of reasonable scale without taking big discounts. Anyone's – You've, anyone's seen this if you've tried to move a large block of public stock and, oh, geez, like why did I just take like a 5 6% discount to do this? Um, and so I think uh, investors' uh, liquidity in the public markets is not as great as people think, and it's therefore overvalued. Um, conversely, in private equity, you're, you have staying power, and you're not – you don't have to invest in a given year. If you don't think it's a good time to invest, you invest less or invest – nobody invests nothing, but you – reduce your investment pace, on the exit, if it's not the right time to sell an investment, either because the investment's having problems, the world is having problems, or the market's having problems, you just wait. And if you wait two, three, four years, what happens? Of course, the IRR comes down, but the multiple of money on the investment, which again, I think is what we all care about the most, is not affected and in fact could end up uh, higher. And so what you saw through the crisis uh, where holders of liquid securities were selling in panic, um, and then those who reinvested into the liquid markets did really well, and people who waited you know, missed out on some of that recovery. Uh, but what happened in private equity, not in every instance, but in many, many instances, was companies were able to withstand that storm, uh, await uh, both the market and a macro recovery, and those turned out to be quite good transactions because you were not forced to sell in the worst moment. So I'm not sure that answers the question, but uh, one of the questions people ask is, is if you stripped out the leverage from private equity, w would the returns be different? Um, now, what's happened over time is the S&P has actually become much more levered because uh, more, uh, particularly m sort of middle, mid-cap companies are much more efficient users of credit, which has been cheap uh, for many years. And so w one thing I think to – one basis on which to analyze managers is to ask them to show you their returns without leverage. And, and look at those returns relative to the public indices, and you'll see how much of the excess return, if any, is simply coming from that. 
Um, I will go back to, to allocators' favorite topic, fees, for a second. Um, and, you know, it was earlier said that, that funds are, because of the, the demand right now, funds are able to pretty much get any terms they want. Um, maybe more directly to Marcy, but if others have comments, are there are there any places where we should just say enough is enough and that fee is just too big, and and draw the line, even if it you know that we think this is a great a great team. <laughs> it's uh, I think that's a very very hard question to answer, uh, primarily because um, a lot of the places where the fees feel very painful are the top performing funds that if you don't invest with them, you are likely not to get back into them. So um, you are looking at the returns, or we are looking at the returns on a net basis. And so our decision point is, are those net returns the top returns, and can we replicate those terms elsewhere? And if the answer is, no, we can't replicate those terms, and we don't think there's you know, succession issues, and we think that there is persistence, which I understand your argument, then we are likely not to walk away. Now, this happens way more, I would say, in the venture world or in some of the growth funds than it does in the buyout fund. Uh, we try not to look at the aggregate fee take of a large buyout manager because that just does, you know, yes, they can manage the fund for less money than in aggregate they are being paid. But that is the market, and if you want access to the market, that is the price to pay. Um, you know, there are very few folks uh, of our size, um, there are very few folks that can change that. And the public plans or the sovereign wealth plans that are changing the fees are doing it in ways that don't benefit uh, someone that's playing at the you know, 50 to 100 million bite size because they're creating separate accounts with managers and having managers um, invest in multiple asset classes for them, which reduces their fee. Uh, so I, I just, it's a very difficult endeavor. And I, I do, we have walked on certain occasions. I don't, there's not a bright line. I can't say that we always walk when someone drops their, uh, their hurdle to zero. There is no hurdle. Um, I would like to say we have because that is one of my personal um, issues. Even if you've outperformed your hurdle every year for the last 20 years, every every fund for the last 20 years, I'm like, well, what's the point? It feels a little bit to me like the um, the mentality of the firm doing that um, it is not one that's aligned with LP interests, and that so it's something that bothers me. Even if you've outperformed, but we, we don't always walk because of that. I'm one person on an investment committee, and other people would choose to um, achieve, hope to achieve the historical returns. Thank you. Any other questions? No. I'm curious uh, how Vic and Marcy um, are responding to what a Rutgers survey study concluded about the disappearance of uh, persistence of first quartile managers within U.S. buyouts. I thought you guys might have maybe differing perspectives on that sure. conclusion. Sure. That's Go ahead, Marcy. Sure. It's, um, <laughs> it's a challenge. Uh, it, um, it, uh, it's a great business, and um, folks raise money before you really understand uh, what the past uh, fund will, will achieve. One of the things we've done is we've studied our um, existing portfolio and we have, I hate to admit it, but we do have some third and quart fourth quartile managers in the portfolio. Uh, I'd like to say we don't, but we've looked at those managers over the years and what we've done is said, there's always a great story, um, as, as everyone in this room knows. Um, the private equity managers are some of the best storytellers in the world, as far as I can see. They and can convince you that you're looking at uh, third and fourth quartile, but there's a reason this is going to go to you know second or first quartile. So we put the data behind it, and um, it, it it does not work that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so we try to stick to um, what what we know has um, happened in our portfolio. And even if we really, really think the personnel are good, there may be something wrong in the decision-making process around a firm, and they may be putting their portfolio together uh, inadequately. And so, you know, we will pass no matter if, if we just 
the numbers tell you if you're a third or fourth quartile, you're not going to make it to second or first quartile if three years in, that's where you are. And that's probably because of the way the IRR works, right? You have so much embedded already that it's, it's something really unusual has to happen to move you to first quartile. So we don't like to invest thinking that we're going to get maybe second quartile. I don't know if that totally answers the question. But. I think it's... Um what, one, you have to sort of think about what, how much you care about the quartile. Some people care a lot, some people care less, and how much risk is embedded if you have a, you know, a low-risk, solid second quartile manager that you don't need to worry about. Great, you know, that has a place in the portfolio. Um, but at least, you know, f from sort of the perspective of my firm and, and probably Warburg too, you know, there are seven or eight firms in private equity that are enduring institutions. And they, from one fund to the next, they, you know, the performance may be a little bit better or worse, but they have process, they have culture, they have training. And they're, they're probably going to be, I know the data doesn't say that, but they're probably going to be pretty consistent. You give your money to Warburg Pickus, they're going to do a great job because they have longstanding processes and discipline and culture and history. Um, and so as, as someone performing diligence, I, I, that's, I would look for process, culture, um, and who are the younger are, who are the younger people that are hired, not necessarily the older people who can you know spend a great yarn and what have you, but like who are the people actually investing the money, and who are the people who are going to be investing the money in the next five years because it's it's a bit different um, and and are they do they have you know that right mix of entrepreneurialism but but also discipline that that's what I would try to look at yeah i, I would um, I would concur with that we um the dispersion and managers over $3 billion, uh, in size is, is much more narrow than when you look at the, the smaller managers. The dispersion is quite wide on the mid-cap managers. So that's, that's, one of the thing, that's one of the reasons that we do run the portfolio like we do. There are, there are folks out there that have said, you know, we don't believe in large cap managers. We believe there's a place in our portfolio for that. And we do believe that uh, the institutions that run this money do have great risk controls. You have a culture. Uh, they're not likely to deviate tremendously from their core strategy over the life of the investment. So that gives us a lot of comfort. Um, well, and the, for now, the, the rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, no, Vic, you're absolutely right. Um, Warburg Pinkus um, so far has never had a third or fourth quarter fund, which um, yeah, I would personally attribute to exactly what, what you have said, um, kind of a great infrastructure, great culture, long-standing. Um, I would like to share a few more thoughts um, in regards to third and fourth quarter funds. Um, in, in my personal opinion, and based on some own research, um, which, which I did by myself very recently, um, in my opinion, um, the impact, the extent of uh, idiosyncratic risk within a private equity fund, especially in, in the small and mid-market, is, is often underestimated. So you typically find some like 10 to 15 portfolio companies in those funds. Now, if you randomly pick 10 to 15 public equity stocks um, from the whole market, hold it for five years, then sell it. Um, do a Monte Carlo simulation on this um, your outcome is, is all over the place, um, given that some like 10 to 15 companies is really not enough to kind of diversify, sufficiently diversify away um, kind of, yeah, this idiosyncratic component. Um, that said, it is, it is extremely difficult to separate skill from luck. So you may end up with a small mid-market fund, which is indeed um, third or fourth quarter. It could be that it is a really skilled manager, but um, yeah, there have been one or two docs in there, and um, yeah, bad luck, which happens, um, which is which is not avoidable, uh, not not totally um, avoidable. Um, on the other hand, you may see a manager with a top quarter fund, and it could be exactly the opposite. Just uh, lots of good luck, maybe even two funds in a row, um, no meaningful skills. So it's. Um, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to, to assess that. Playing off of that comment on diversification, that most funds will have somewhere between you know, kind of 10 and 12 portfolio companies, uh, I'll take the contrarian point of view of um, raising a portfolio fund that only has four companies in it. 
concern might be very little diversification. What happens in that scenario when those companies go belly up? So how do you explain um, the need for diversification in a very potentially thin pool of companies compared to what more of the studies have shown of the traditional kind of 10 to 12 portfolio companies? Yeah, I think it's even more stark than that, actually, because in a, in a larger fund, a Warburg Pincus fund or, you know, a Blackstone fund, you, you'll have 50, 60, 70. It's even more diversified. Um, so it, it's, uh, you're right. It's your, if one in our little thing, if we have five companies and one's a bust, like, not going to be a good fund, <laughs> right? Period, full stop. So uh, that's the reason, at least for us, whereas in our traditional fund, we might have 200 investors. We have less than 20 investors in this fund. So it was, you, you, cause you can't, there's no way you can uh, convince, you would be non-credible if you tried to convince people that that risk that you highlighted is not a real risk. And so, so the, the investor really has to believe, goes back again to process, risk management, discipline, that you're, you're not gonna screw up. And if you buy something that maybe it generates a seven or 8% return as opposed to a 13 or 14, that'll be okay. But but it's I, I think it's it's a real risk when you concentrate, and it's not it's not for everybody. Um, in, in particular, what we found it's it's really for a public pension plan. It's very difficult, and what we found was that sovereigns um, and families were they understood this more because it was more akin to their their own way of investing directly it was to take concentrated positions. But you're right. So in terms of how many funds we invest in, we, we look to invest in uh, anywhere between seven to 10 funds uh, per year. Uh, so over a cycle, um, we, we run a lot of separate accounts, so it's not necessarily in a fund construct, but we think you know diversification over a cycle is anywhere from 20 to 30 managers, but that's across that that's buyout, that's growth, and that's some some venture. So that's uh, not a lot of venture. If you added uh, it's a couple of early stage managers, if you added late stage, we'd bump it up a, a little bit into the 30s. So it obviously depends on the risk profile of, of the client that we're managing the capital for. Uh, we. Um, our co-investment portfolio has outperformed uh, our partnership portfolio, and we have been doing co-investment since 1996. So you can cut it just about any way you would like, and we have outperformed. The, um, the, we think the reason for outperformance is, uh, you know, it's two reasons. One is uh, we are committed to these managers uh, that we co-invest with, so we're not paying uh, fee and carry on that. So that does add some outperformance to it, but that's not the reason for all of the outperformance. The other is a selection, mm -hmm. and what we have tried to do is, uh, it's a very simple strategy, um, is to zero in on the deals where we know the GP and the partner uh, have experience in, in that sector, and that's worked very well for us over the last 20 years. Okay. All right, well, I'd like to thank our uh, panelists for today.